Um, it's nine o'clock now. Okay. Um, let's start sharp. And uh, if people are, are joining later, I'm, I'm sure they, they get a grip of, of the house and, and, and what I expect. Um, basically, I just want to say hello to everyone joining this morning and also thank you, um, Marina, to join us, taking your time um, for being an expert, uh, expert on hiring female talent. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Anya, uh, I'm the senior content manager here at Kenju, and I'm doing on a monthly basis these webinars with H HR experts and managers. Um, so today, as you know, we speak about a topic that is super important um, because a more diverse uh, workplace with more women, um, for example, in tech and leadership positions, um, create healthier workspace, um, is proven to get better results and more accurate, accurately reflects our customer and client base. So um, to begin with, I um, would like to tell you a little bit about Marina and her, her bio and also the structure of this meeting. Um, so the webinar will last roughly one hour to 10 o'clock. And after Marina has shared her real life examples on how to hire female experts, um, there will be time to answer your questions and you, could, you can put your questions directly here into the chat. Um, uh, and I will just um, start uh, reading them out. Um, at the end of the chat. Um, and also I've collected those questions you had when you signed up for this webinar. Um, also bear in mind uh, in a one hour webinar, we can't answer all questions, but at the uh, tomorrow I'm going to share um, an email with the uh, like biggest key points and also um, Marina's uh, email. And then you can just uh, question, uh, send your questions directly to her. I'm also recording this webinar, um, which will uh, I will put uh, on YouTube and I send this as well. So you have all your notes on there. Um, so Marina is on a mission to change the world of diversity hiring using data. And um, she's not only a former head of recruitment at Colibri, um, but also she's now joining um, Klarna. Um, to work with, and she's also been um, voted the Forbes 30 under 30 uh, recipient. So um, she has a pretty um, impressive resume. And um, away from the office, she also partnered with Google to hold workshops uh, on seminars that promote and empower women in the gaming industry. Um, and also, as you know, um, Kendro's recruiting tool, tool um, offers like a feature from finding the right people to interviews and creating the perfect onboarding um, on the right applicant tracking system um, to attract and retain the best talent. So um, if you'd like to try out our uh, Kendra feature, we offer a 14 day free trial. And also I'm going to um, send you this in the um, email which I'm sending you tomorrow. So now I'm going to hand over um, to Marina. She's going to share her screen. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward what uh, she has to say about hiring female tech talent. Thank you, Anya, for the lovely introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen quickly. All right. Anya, could you confirm that, that everything's working well from your end? You can see everything nicely? Yes, yes, it's perfect. Okay, great. Well, um, as Anya mentioned today, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into the topic of um, hiring for diversity. Uh, I'm going to give a few examples related to the gaming industry because that is my most recent experience. And I really do feel like we have a lot to learn from uh, the way that gaming has approached historically topics around diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity. But at the same time, I, I really want to say that today's talk is going to be about um, attracting underrepresented communities, bringing them into your hiring funnels, and then sort of creating a process that allows for um, equitable, with equitable design that allows for a fair interviewing process for everyone. So even though I know that 
many companies, um, gaming in particular, are struggling to hire um, female talent. What I really want to focus on today is intersectional diversity and hiring with this kind of um, spectrum of diversity in mind, because unless we do have a process that is equitable for everyone, um, and that of course includes women, I know that is a big pain point, we are not going to be able to reach um, this um, level of inclusion afterwards and diversity, genuine inclusion in our organization, unless we look at talent holistically. So with that being said, um, I'd like to start it off by looking at a little bit at storytelling. Uh, and I know it might not be the most traditional way to start a, a conversation around hiring and, and recruiting, uh, but I really do believe that if we look at the stories that we uh, are being told and the, the, our story and how we want our story to be told and how we want to see ourselves represented, I think we can learn a lot um, on what makes people tick, and what makes people sort of convert when they land on your careers page, what makes people feel appreciated in your hiring process. So we really need to start seeing people individually and try to understand their story and narrative that they're trying to serve us in order for us to be able to understand how we can attract them best. So with that being said, I have this um, interesting photo uh, here. I'd like to kick it off by asking you to, to just take a look. And if you've already seen this movie, then you know, probably know what it's all about. If you haven't, I'll give you a few seconds to think about um, what you think this movie might be about. And while you're thinking about that, um, one, one thing that really for me always stood up when I uh, stood out when I talk about this, this movie and this photo is it, it kind of always leads me towards thinking that this movie is about one particular theme and it is because we have an all male cast. So um, maybe you thought about, you know, civil rights or maybe you thought about this movies about family values. Maybe you thought it was a romance movie. Um, what you think this movie is about, probably not many of you thought about the last thing, but that is the thing that I really want to showcase with this photo. And that is that when we have a photo like this, when we have a crew, um, a movie crew like this, there's only a limited amount of options that you think this movie could be about. And that is the power uh, that representation can have. So this movie in particular, it's called First Blood. It is three decades old, and it actually follows the storyline of, um, of a white male hero who is trying to figure out life after um, the war in Vietnam. And now he's back and he's dealing with this build up aggression um, and he has to kind of deal with a lot of PTSD uh, um, moments that, that he is experiencing. And so somehow, you know, this movie, as I mentioned, is three decades old and somehow it sounds familiar to us, right? It's for sure not the first time that you've heard of a movie with this storyline. And the story of this movie, to a certain extent, feels familiar to us. It most certainly feels familiar to me, and this movie is as old as I am. And the reason for that, even though I cannot see myself represented in a movie of this sort, is that Hollywood in this particular case has made sure with the content that it has been serving us for years and decades to actually familiarize a story with such a movie, with such a crew and bring it closer to us, even though we can never see ourselves, many of us can never see ourselves represented in a movie like this. So um, if I make an analogy using this photo to um, seeing this photo instead, uh, instead in a promo trailer, you see this photo on a career stage, uh, of a potential employer when you go to apply for a job. Um, and now we know, you know, there, there are uh, career stages are now full of photos, fun events that the companies do. They try to attract talent through, um, through, through such employer branding tools. And, you know, what would you see? What would you think if you saw a photo like this on a, on a company stage? You would think that this is the type of talent that thrives in the organization, that this is the type of talent that is actually able to be successful. And this is the type of talent that the company prefers to hire. So as a member of an underrepresented community, you actually would probably feel like there's no room for me in this storyline um, with this company. But let's fast forward a few years, uh, a few decades actually into the future. And um, nowadays we are able to stream content with such a promo photo, right? And it's the change that most certainly 
um, did not happen on its own. Um, a change of this sort actually requires a lot of speaking up, a lot of fighting to see ourselves represented in the content, in the content that we are streaming, uh, to see a reflection of us. And even though, of course, with Hollywood, it's not the claim that we've we've reached this peak of diversity and, and great representation, but we've still moved um, in the right direction. And so with that being said, we see progress being made. We see more companies opening up these important conversations. And before we kind of dive into the actual hiring, um, I wanted to, um, to, to tell you a little bit about how this kind of translates into gaming and why stories and representation is important in the first place. So um, if the reason why we want our stories seen and heard and represented in the content that we're seeing in the products that we're using is that if basically we only see stories of white cis males around us, then how can the stories of anyone else be heard and seen, right? If we have this just perpetuating cycle of um, males, men making products and then telling their story through products, which we will get to, um, and then that translating to this kind of vicious cycle, um, there is this cycle of exclusion in that case, right? And so Viola Davis has this amazing quote that I absolutely love. And, and she says, let me tell you something. The only thing that separates women of color from anyone else is opportunity. You cannot win an Emmy for roles that are simply not there. And so the, the math is really simple. If you cannot tell diverse stories, you cannot create a diverse industry. And so if you cannot create a diverse industry, it's going to be really hard to hire for diversity. And so with that being said, let's briefly look at gaming. So gaming is a really good example, even though you're not, you might not be a gamer, um, some of you might for already listening and uh, you might be able to relate even further. Uh, but gaming is a great exa example because we have sort of a pun intended game within a game. So um, we have gaming as um, that creates products that tell sto stories, right? Games that have that sometimes can have very complex storylines that can go really deep in the psychology, in the socioeconomic situation of a particular group, country, time, era, um, and and so they are in a way, even though they might be abstract, even though they might be hypothetical, um, they are a a reflection of our past and our reality. And so the, on the other hand, when it comes to the, the people who are producing games, who are giving these storylines to the world, we have companies, right, who themselves need to be diverse in order to be able to tell diverse stories, as we mentioned. So we have kind of this, this uh, duality here where we have the opportunity or we also have the threat of creating a more diverse industry from both consumerism perspective and also from, from, from that kind of business and, and um, company employee hiring perspective. So you think with, with this in mind, you know, uh, with this huge opportunity to diversify on those two fronts, maybe gaming has actually uh, has, has been able to pivot and, and create a really diverse industry. Well, sadly, um, it is the opposite. Uh, we're still struggling a lot when it comes to the gaming industry to um, create more diverse narratives um, and to, uh, to actually empower more underrepresented communities. And so I have this photo here, which is um, um, a, a group of um, famous characters from, from uh, games, um, computer games. And then when we look at a photo like this and we think about who makes games today, we really cannot not wonder what their lives look like and what, what these people, you know, what they think about, what they struggle with, what their pain is. And when you look at them, you look at the numbers and you see that the majority of gaming professionals are actually cis white males, then it is very hard for us to expect that they would be able to build a diverse set of game characters, a diverse set of storylines and going deep into presenting life experiences that they have never experienced or been able to experience themselves due to their position in the society. And so it is only logical then that like I mentioned, we have this cycle of exclusion that the games that 
these men in the industry are currently making are reflective of their lives and their experiences. And when that happens, then we have characters like these ones on screen who are actually are just a reflection of the people who've made them. So how can we turn this around, like, right? How can we, um, how can we actually um, change the current state of affairs? Well, one way for sure would actually be to focus on bringing in and attracting a more diverse talent uh, talent from underrepresented marginalized communities who can actually start putting a little bit of themselves into their work and start telling their story and through their story start diversifying the industry. And this goes for really uh, for, for many, I, I firmly believe for many industries out there where even though you might not be able to overtly see the outcome of a homogenous group creating something like you can in games, right? Because it, it is a direct reflection. Um, there is still a lot of um, problematic designs that can result from a homogenous culture. And one of them that we are so used to hearing when it comes to diversity um, and the, the outcome of teams that are not diverse is lack of innovation. So with that being said, um, what happens then when, um, when games are not more diverse, like we said, uh, we, we don't get to tell everyone's story. We create a mono story. And this is simply something that really, when we look at diversity hiring, then uh, prevents us from building an environment where everyone's stories are being heard and told. And so when you start a tribe bringing in talent where not everyone's story is being celebrated, it is not only hard to attract such talent and bring them into your organization, but it is even harder than afterwards to retain this talent and create a sense of belonging internally. So let's see um, one last quote before we move into the, the actual practical uh, initiatives that might help. So um, here's how powerful stories can actually be and why we need to think about them uh, through the, the prism of, of hiring as well. So um, we have this wonderful quote by Kerry Washington um, and I'm gonna give you a minute to, to just go through it um, but while you are, basically what this quote is applicable to any industry out there that wants to attract a, a diverse consumer base and diverse talent. And it is really here beautifully described um, how underrepresented communities are so used to being pitted against one another and, you know, made to feel like there's space for only one because they might be part of a quota hiring or they might be part of an initiative that's gonna result in a PR uh, post on LinkedIn about the company having reached an X, Y, Z numbers when it comes to diversity. It talks very little about the belonging and the inclusion that is happening within the organization. And so I think this, um, this quote really offers a glimpse, again, when we talk about the story, understanding the story of the talent that we're trying to attract. Um, in fact, here we can see that underrepresented talent oftentimes feels like they either might be a victim of tokenism, which we, as we know, is this hiring to hit the quota only, not seeing somebody for their individual value and contribution, but just seeing them as a diversity number. And, and at the same time, feeling like even though they might get hired in an organization, they might make it through the hiring process, that they actually might not be able to be promoted at the same rate as their uh, maybe uh, white male counter counterparts would. And in that case, feeling like, we as people from the underrepresented communities are pitted against one another to make, to make us feel like we cannot all succeed, right? There's only a limited amount of space up there at the top. And when you transfer this into the hiring process as well, when you look at the hiring numbers, how your funnels are, are sort of um, trickling down as the, the, your interviewing process goes, uh, it is very often noticeable with companies that they are disproportionately losing underrepresented talent as the funnel progresses. And that is something that people from the underrepresented communities are also aware of. And that is due to quite a number of factors, but one of them, the most prominent one that can creep into every single stage of your hiring process is, is definitely bias. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So without further ado, um, we're gonna look at what we can do as you know, people who might 
be either directly recruiters or HR folks who have the power to actually design equitable processes, hiring processes, uh, or some of you out there might be um, hiring managers who are just now in this webinar looking to um, maybe get some ideas on how you can attract uh, more um, underrepresented communities that would be a great addition to your team and help your team continue innovating. Um, and so what I'm gonna tell you um, here is I really wanna make sure that um, I make it clear that these are things that have worked for us with, with, when I worked with Colibri Games um, that were a result of a lot of back and forth, that were a result of a lot of trying things out and seeing what works and what doesn't work. There is no silver bullet for doing this perfectly. There's no magic recipe that's actually going to help you go there from one day to another. It's just not out there. And I'm to a certain extent happy that is true because this should be the work that would be highly personalized to your organization. So you know best what can work and what cannot work in your organization, what kind of set of values you want to promote during your hiring process and what you can incorporate and what's not gonna make sense. And so I really, really wanna encourage you that you are critical when you look at these, that you ask questions if you have them um, that we can answer uh, shortly. Um, that are going to allow you to understand how this can be adapted to your organization. So with that, uh, with that being said, um, I'm going to start us off by um, sort of telling you how this process worked out for us. And so the first thing that we did when we started realizing um, we definitely need to pivot more and push when it comes to um, hiring for diversity, we need to uh, make sure that we continue innovating as a company. And in order to do that, we need talent from underrepresented communities to come in here, tell us their story and have the space to grow. And so we started segmenting basically our entire hiring process and we kind of audited what we do, um, what we wanna continue doing and what are the main milestones that happen from the moment we either reach out to somebody and source them or somebody applies, lands on our career page and applies, all the way until offboarding, onboarding, uh, pre-boarding, um, offer stages, and so on. And so naturally, we started with the what we felt well, like was the first thing, and that is how are we presenting ourselves to the world, right? So what are the candidates seeing when they land on our LinkedIn page, when they land on our careers page, when they hear about us um, in a podcast or they stumble across one of our games if they're gamers and they decide to look us up and go on our website. Um, so what is their first connection with our brand, right? With our employer brand. And so here we, we realized very early on, if we wanna make a change, we wanna be able to track what we are doing, where we are right now and where, where we are gonna be once we decide to start changing things and try and understand what helped us and what didn't help us on that journey so that we can continue doing more of the things that actually worked. And so what we did here is we partnered up with our amazing um, in-house web developer, uh, Jenny, who actually allowed us to create um, this simple but very, very functional dashboard with Google Studios, Google Data Studio. And essentially what the photo that you're seeing right here uh, represents is the demographic when it comes to gender in this case, demographic uh, of the people who actually land on our website. And then of course, from our end internally, we could then see how this translates into applications. So is the ratio sort of still the same uh, when it comes to, um, to the gender of our applicants? And so for us, it was important to not only increase um, the, the number of women that land on our website, in this case, when we look at the gender split, but also at the same time, translate this in a higher number of application coming from women, coming from, uh, from non-binary people, which for us was in this case, um, hard to track when it comes to the actual gender spectrum. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure that based on the numbers that we could observe, that we definitely had a movement. And so what we did here is we started looking at 
what are the things that people interact with when they land on our page? And for this, we used a super cool tool called Hotjar. So Hotjar also has a free, um, actually a free tier. Um, it is limiting to a certain extent, but it can definitely help you out if you just want to give it, you know, take it for a spin. Hotjar is basically a tool that allows you to see how the people who land on your page interact with your page. So it's kind of like a recording of somebody's session on your page. It is completely anonymized, of course, so you cannot see who the actual person is, but that does not matter. What you actually wanna see is what kind of content people click more on, what kind of uh, you know, page they wanna continue going on. Do they expand the little section where you talk about your benefits? Uh, do they expand the section where you talk about maybe your parental benefits? Uh, you know, so what is the demographic of the talent that's landing on your page and what is it that they wanna read more about? And so, we started looking at, of course, how we were presenting ourselves in terms of, um, in terms of our internal diversity. So at that time, we were a company of around 110 people, and we come from 25 different countries. So almost one in five people in the company is from another country, and that is, for me, absolutely mind blowing for a company of our size. And you know, when we audited the website first, we actually could not get a feeling of this diversity that we had internally. And it was very interesting to observe because we, the people who were working in the company were already uh, surrounded by the people um, around us who were so visibly diverse, right? That it was kind of not very intuitive for us. So this is where our bias crept in. So it was not uh, very intuitive for us to actually see the careers page and think this might not actually be reflective of the of the diversity at least national diversity that we have internally and so we started working around this we started rolling out testimonials we started working with our with our brand team to actually create blog posts featuring people who uh, who came from abroad who moved to germany to talk a little bit more about their experience talk about the culture shock you know all of these things that we felt like candidates in this case on that spectrum of diversity who might not be locals actually might be um, stressed about or might be anxious about when it comes to moving to another country. Um, and so it was important for us to give away this impression that we are working on supporting people who are looking to make a move, that we actually have an agency whom we collaborate with for this reason in particular, so that we can provide candidates with the most kind of with the smoothest process that's going to alleviate at least a portion of that anxiety when it comes to moving to a new place. And so this was um, sort of um, one of the, the first things that we looked at, but then even though this helped us improve our numbers, um, definitely what kind of was the next step for us was to address the fact that even though we might have more women, for example, land on the um, the careers page, we, it still did not account for the fact that, for instance, um, as we probably by this point know of this study that actually, this research that uh, showed that women apply for jobs uh, if they are 60% fit, if they are 100% fit, excuse me, and men apply for jobs if they're 60% fit. So that means just to give you a, a more concrete example, if you write in your job post that you, in your required skills, that you want a master's degree, there's a very high likelihood, unless that is absolutely true, which I think would be a rare instance where a master's degree would be an absolute must. And yet we see that very often in job descriptions. Um, it would be very likely that by just this one point alone, you are killing gender diversity when it comes to your ratio of men and women applying. So it is these things that, you know, when they accumulate could really be detrimental to the funnel that you end up with when it comes to your, your um, sort of passive applicants, right? And so what we, what we said to ourselves, of course, was we need to absolutely find a way to, um, first of all, remove, uh, so let's move on to that section. So remove any sort of requirement that actually might not be absolutely necessary. So what I mean by that is 
Um, we try now in our job descriptions to, um, if years of experience are not an absolute must. So if it might be a junior position, if it might be a position where we could account for a lot of transferable skills from another sector or another industry or you know another field of work, we actually try not to put years of experience at all. Um, because we we want to we we have a process in place where we actually can assess somebody's fit for the job without actually having to look at how many years of experience in particular they might have on their CV. And so, the next thing that we did was then trying to understand how powerful language can be in terms of converting somebody into applying or feeling the belonging or feeling the interest and the relatability with your company, with your business, with your mission statement, when they actually go on your career stage and they open a, a job posting that they might be interested in applying. And so by this, I mean, um, we, um, we looked at um, what we call the gender, how gendered the language might be. So whether we were using more masculine forms or feminine forms, and of course, uh, uh, we, we, um, we could uh, see that we actually were uh, using forms that could be, or language that could be uh, potentially considered as masculine. And this is usually due to the way that we use language, right, by default. So uh, with these pattern language patterns that we have that we no longer think about, right? While I'm telling you these things now, I'm not thinking about my English. I'm not thinking necessarily about my sentence structure. So this is very kind of on a very kind of under the radar level. Um, and so it was important when people do read with that sort of subconsciousness activated that they actually do not feel rejected by what they're reading. And what I'm gonna give you a very simple example or a few of them across the diversity spectrum. If you write stuff in your job description, such as we want somebody who's used to working with modern technologies, then you are potentially saying no to a lot of older workers who might feel like they, they are you know, signaling to me that they want a younger workforce. What does it mean, modern technology? I mean, technology on its own is modern. That's, that's the nature of it. So trying to question, you know, wh what are we trying to say with these words? What are we trying to say with, with the job description that we have out there? If you say we want somebody who is very, um, very happy to work in a fast-paced environment, you might be closing your door to all the um, working mothers out there who might think that you will expect them to play ping pong after work uh, with your crew. And if that doesn't happen, then they'll be let go during probation. So um, if you are using terms such as we need somebody who can meet aggressive sales targets, then you might be signaling that with, just with the, the word itself being marked as masculine, you might be signaling again that you would prefer somebody who is, um, who is uh, uh, male presenting in this case, right? So this is really important to, to pay attention to because I feel like we don't oftentimes pay um, as much attention to language per se that we use, and it can be really, really powerful in converting the underrepresented groups that actually land on your careers page. And so I wanna uh, offer two recommendations here um, that we've used both of them. So the first one is Textio. Um, Textio is a paid tool. Um, it is pricey. And I know that if you are a smaller organization, uh, if you have, you put three job descriptions a month out there, it probably doesn't make sense to pay for such an expensive tool unless you can afford it. But that's still no excuse not to kind of uh, look deeper into the, the power of language and, and restructuring your job descriptions. And so we've also used the gender bias decoder, which is free uh, and can really help um, with, uh, with understanding the, the tone of the, the job description and can really help you kind of weed out those um, gendered uh, words that might actually be off-putting for marginalized communities. And so next up, we cannot not talk about sourcing. Uh, so if you are still in this day and age, just you know going for the post and pray approach, so just waiting for people to passively apply, We've talked about the way the differences between men and women and how they apply for jobs based on the job requirements. So even with just that one thing, you're already missing out on underrepresented talent. So it is absolutely necessary to kind of level out the playing field to actually, um, as much as possible, source for diversity and to um, consciously reach out to underrepresented communities, to consciously challenge uh, your biases when it comes to the people that you find fitting for your organization and to, um, to actually increase 
your funnels diversity by bringing actively bringing people into the pipeline. But I, here I, I do have an interesting thing that we tried out. Um, so we've kind of we've observed that uh, just by looking at you know men and women applying, as we said, um, that if we start sourcing for diversity when the position already opens, um, we are already to a certain extent in certain situations. Um, putting at jeopardy the diversity of our pipeline. And what I mean by that is that by the time you start proactively reaching out to people, bringing underrepresented communities into the pipeline, the people who have applied already are far advanced in the process already. And so what that means, especially with the presence of interviewing bias and, and you know all, all these things that are part of us being humans, you already might be giving a dis disproportionate advantage to the people who have applied first. And in some cases that might be a member of the underrepresented community. It might be a female presented candidate, but it might not be. And the likelihood of it not being is actually higher. So the odds are against you. And so what we did to try and combat this is um, we had a, a tech vacancy um, where we needed to find three people. And um, we said, we spoke with the hiring manager and we said, um, would you be up for it if instead of opening the position immediately, you actually gave us two weeks where we would just open it internally so that we sort of have the pipeline overview for us only. And we just sourced, we just gave it a big sourcing push in these two weeks and essentially tried to bring in as many people from underrepresented communities with intersectional diversity in mind, right? So it's not just going to be men or women. So just really reaching out to a wide variety of, of uh, marginalized communities, bringing them into the pipeline before we actually open the position. And then two weeks after actually publish it on and just continue with, with the process as we normally do. It was a big commitment from somebody who needed three people in his team. Um, but we, I think in this case, and, and it goes for all the initiatives that we did, we had people who were really on board with making this work. And that was really important because when we would come to the hiring managers with this case for hiring for diversity, there would be very little pushback on understanding why this is important, right? And this really gave us an advantage when it comes to talking about um, how we're gonna do it rather than why. And so in this case, we managed to get the person on board um, and we kicked off the process with kind of position, the position being sort of um, under the radar for two weeks. And what we ended up with was the first three people who made it to the last step of the process and got offers were all three members of the underrepresented communities. And so I'm so proud of this initiative because it's not, again, it's not a silver bullet. It's not something we can apply for every single role that we have out there. We need the hiring manager buy-in. We need the business buy-in. You're gonna need it too. So it's, it's not an easy job. I do have to point that out. But at the same time, if you try it out with a position, for example, or a hiring manager that you know would be on board for giving this a shot, you have a great case study that you can expand on. You have something to pitch to your business leaders. You have something to pitch to the next hiring manager. You get to have an ally in the hiring manager where it worked because they get praise as well at this point for, for fostering diversity in their hiring processes, for having a diverse team. Um, and so start small is what I'm trying to say. Try it out, see what worked, see what didn't work reiterate, build a case study out of it and continue using it to, to, to continue moving the needle forward. And so um, here, before we, we come close to wrapping it up, um, I, I have a few more things that I think are probably things that you might have heard of by now, but they're really um, very, very, very important. Um, so the first one is the, the topic of unconscious bias. And so, excuse me. So it's something that our hiring managers get extensive training on, uh, on what types of bias there are out there, why we are all biased, why everyone is subject to this, um, why it's not an embarrassing thing to, to feel an affinity towards a certain group of people, towards a person that you know might be coming from your tiny little hometown in your tiny little country, and you just feeling like you never have the chance to actually, in this foreign country where you're living right now, speak with somebody who knows your language, who knows your customs, who celebrates the same holidays as you do. And so we're trying to normalize this in 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 my former company. Uh, and we try to 
uh, really give people the sense of how normal this is one and two, how we can combat this because it's a killer for diversity. And at the end of the day, we wanna hire people for the value that they bring and for the work that they can produce. And we don't wanna hire them for you know, where they come from and, and all these things that are not work related. Um, and so um, unconscious bias in this case, this sort of training um, was something that for us was a must do together with the other things that we were doing because isolating unconscious bias training on its own, doing that and thinking that you're moving the needle is actually not going to work out because people are biased by nature and it's not a one-off initiative. And so we need all these other supporting things and this constant educational piece, you know, it's a continuous journey journey for all of us quite literally and it needs to be regarded as such so we need these nudges continuously that are actually going to allow us to stay on track and so one other thing of course that is extremely important is the standardized uh, hiring process so um, actually um, building scorecards for the hiring managers uh, having having them prepare questions uh, beforehand filling it out as soon as possible before the actual bias and retards them and meeting other people and, and comparing and contrasting them with other candidates can kind of creep in and, and, and make their decision biased and, and distorted. Um, if you are having uh, people interview in a panel, uh, then have them submit scorecards separately, then ideally don't allow them to see the scorecard of the other person. If you're doing debriefing meetings about somebody's interviewing process so far, make sure that everyone who's attending the meeting is actually has actually filled out the scorecard already so that uh, when they come into the meeting, they're not going to be biased by what the others uh, say, by what others' feedback was. Um, and so these, these things that really matter when it comes to making sure that everyone goes through the exact same process so that you can make sure that by using equitable design, you're actually giving everyone a fair chance um, to get to the end of the process. And um, last but not least, we talked about storytelling, representation, seeing ourselves in the stories that we are that we are being given, that we're being told. And this goes for the interviewing panels as well. If you see it as, as a way of storytelling, right? What is your organization about? What the panel represents? Who is interviewing you? Who are the people who, are, who you're talking to? Um, well, in this case, it's really important that you try to diversify your, uh, your, your, interview, your interviewers and your hiring panels because people want to see themselves represented in the people they're talking to. And if they go through five rounds of interviews and all they see is the same as, you know, um, then uh, at the end of the day, they're going to feel like there might not be a, a seat at the table uh, for them after all. So um, just something to, uh, to be mindful of. And so to wrap it up, um, I have this kind of snap of, again, you look at storytelling. Uh, Colibri Games in 2016, when the company was made by five men, uh, five uh, young uh, students who you know worked from their student dorm, very inspirational story, but they were putting themselves, their lives, their, their narratives, into the game that they were making. So Idol Miner Tycoon, our first game, uh, bottom left. And you can see it's four miners who are digging uh, to, to you know, multiply their fortune. Uh, and then as the company grew and you know, the founders very early on moved from a very small town in Germany to Berlin with this idea in particular to actually be able to attract more diverse talent coming to the capital, um, we started hiring people who actually started bringing themselves into the work they were doing. They started bringing in their story. They started demanding their story to be heard. And what this resulted is you can see just a few years later, this is our, our game from last year at a restaurant tycoon. Um, you can see a, a promo photo that features a, a wide variety of, you know, on the diversity spectrum. Uh, and that is only and because we actually had people who were willing to tell their stories and, and who you know, felt, felt like they had a seat at the table for their stories to be heard. And so with that being said, um, thank you for, for your attention uh, so far. Uh, I know Anya has been probably monitoring the QA uh, section. If there are any questions that uh, you have, I'm happy to answer them now or just speak me on LinkedIn afterwards.
Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Marina. That was really interesting. Um, I think we can talk about this for a long time, and especially in like most uh, Western countries with a war of talent, um, everybody should by now know how important the subject is of not finding the, 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 the gap between actually available positions and all the talent out there, maybe mm -hmm. not even knowing about the possibilities and opportunities or reading it and thinking I'm not the right fit. So um, to, create, to, to bridge this gap, I think is super important. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, um, guys uh, and ladies, <laughs> if you um, have questions, write them in the chat here. Um, I'm just going to um, ask a few questions from the sign up sections. Um, one being, um, how do you actually avoid gender stereotyping in your advertisement? You explained uh, how you do it with a tool, but um, many smaller companies maybe don't want to buy a tool. Is there a, 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 like a, some tips you can share without using tools, just how you do it? Mm -hmm. So there's a, a free tool that I mentioned, Gender Bias Decoder, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and it's going to allow you to at least address the gender mark language. Um, but at the end of the day, it needs to be a, a company-wide effort about deciding how you want to present yourself out there to the world and to your potential candidates through your job descriptions in this particular case, through your careers page, and then how you want to make the tone of your communication come through. And one thing that really worked well for us, apart from using the, the two tools that I mentioned, uh, was actually working closely with our brand team, who are experts at, you know, um, the tone of voice a company should have um, and, and, you know, our, our style, the way that we present ourselves out there. So if you have a brand team, if you even have just a brand specialist, you know, it doesn't need to be a fully fledged department on its own. Um, go and talk to that person and just um, inquire a little bit more about what is the, you know, what, what, how do we want to present ourselves as a business? What is our brand all about? How can we transfer that into the conversation that we um, that in the communication that we have with our candidates. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's a, a good first stop to actually get you into the, the way of thinking around using inclusive language um, and, and how to make it enticing for underrepresented communities. And probably also not um, to put like a, a gazillion requirements because also um, mostly if you have um, like a man and a woman applying for example for a job advertisement many um, ladies don't if they don't feel they have at least a certain amount of of numbers um, being um, written on this uh, job advertisement um, mm -hmm. let's say a man thinks oh 60 percent is enough i can i can do it and for a woman the score is much higher right Absolutely. And there's, you know, another topic here, which is the topic of disability. So you need to make sure that your job descriptions are um, actually readable, that you, there is a separation between the sections. So uh, make sure that when you look at it yourself, uh, try doing it at like 10 p.m. before you go to bed, uh, if you're a person without a disability, and just seeing like when you're sleepy, just going through it and think about like, you know, is this easy to soak in? Is this, is this information actually accessible for me um, and actually, uh, you know, uh, try to, to make it easy for people to understand what you're trying to sell, right? So that goes also for too long uh, job descriptions that are just not going to hold attention uh, of, of many people. So it, it is definitely something that, that needs to be thought of, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, Martina just wrote, how do you evaluate if a company is diverse? Which company would you say is doing great in Germany or Europe? and what KPIs makes them great? That's a very good question. Um, I think it depends on what diverse means for you in particular and what kind of representation you wanna see in a company. Um, I've had the opportunity to be on another panel recently and uh, it was a, a panel related to women in tech. And it was really interesting because a few women who are engineers themselves said, when I apply for a new job, or when I'm contacted rather, which happens more often by recruiters to interview with their company, what I actually do, if I find it interesting enough, I would actually go through their employee list and I would see if I know anyone 
or I know someone who can introduce me to someone who works there so that I can ask them, hey, how are women treated in your tech teams? And I found this absolutely amazing because the, the market is moving in that direction where people, especially people from underrepresented communities are now demanding to see more diversity, are demanding to see more inclusion, are demanding companies to actually go beyond just putting a public statement on LinkedIn, changing their logo to, to uh, pride colors in June, but actually now saying, I'm gonna go to your people, to your teams, and I'm gonna find somebody in your company who is a member of a marginalized community, and I'm gonna ask them, what is their company doing to support you? And so when you think about the KPIs or, you know, what would be the measure of success, I would say companies really need to start thinking about how they treat their people because their people at the end of the day are their best brand ambassadors. So you can do the best employer branding in the universe. If the people who are within your company go out for, you know, dinner or drinks after work and they meet somebody else who might be interested in your company and they tell them, you know what, this is not the right place for you you know, I wouldn't come and work here if I had the chance to do it again. Now I'm staying for whichever reason, but I wouldn't do it if I had the chance to do it again. And so I think that it's really important to, um, to, to understand that from recruiting side, we can bring diverse talent in, we can work on these, you know, inclusive practices that can allow us to have a fairer process, attract more underrepresented communities. But at the end of the day, what happens with the retention is what's going to then feed back into that cycle of, how are we attracting people, right? What are the people that are currently working for us saying? Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. And can you name a few um, companies um, that you think are doing a great job apart from Colibri? <laughs> <laughs> I think one company that I've really admired for a very long time is SAP. I am absolutely obsessed by the amount of effort that they are putting into um, diversity and inclusion, pay equity, their ERGs. Um, if you go on the, like SAP in Germany in particular, I'm connected to many people from SAP Germany where these people have nothing to do with hiring. So these people are not recruiters, they're not HR people. They might not even be hiring for their teams. These are the people who share how they feel as parts of the, as members of the LGBT community every month of the, uh, of the year, but June in particular, these are people who are sharing how they feel, women, how they, they feel on, on the pay equity status that they have. And I feel like it's a really great thing to see when employees from a particular company by no incentive of the company's own, from what I can see, actually feel like they wanna share with the world on their public profiles and their private profiles, why they feel acknowledged in their organization. And so I think if there's one company that you kind of want to check out and you want to see what kind of initiatives they have, and this is ongoing with SAP, and I love that about them. It's never a one-off thing. It is always, a, we did this now, but now we're doing something else. But the next thing we're going to do is this. And they're acknowledging that the system that we have at the moment that favors one particular group of people is actually a system that has been in the making for so long, we cannot undo this systemic injustice by just putting out one initiative, by just doing one unconscious bias training, and then we're just ticking that off, putting a post on LinkedIn and forgetting about it completely. So if you wanna check out one company, um, go check SAP. Yeah, absolutely right. I, I was thinking this the same in, in June, like uh, a lot of people, a lot of companies seem to think it's enough to just write a nice statement and hang it on the wall in their office and maybe change the LinkedIn profile. But that was it that like, if you looked at their employees, at least of the LinkedIn, um, I was wondering if you had tips um, of how to actively reach out to female or, or, or um, disabled or, or any um, diverse people like, um, is one thing to actually write the, the job description, but how do you actually reach out to them and find actively them? Mm -hmm. So I've, I think we've moved when it comes to, um, to the, hiring, the hiring approach that we wanted to have. We've necessarily moved from finding underrepresented talent to attracting underrepresented talent. And this really ties in with everything that I've been saying. It's again, the power of language. The difference really matters. And what I mean by that is that 
when we go and we find a particular person, we could very easily step into the domain of tokenism. And at the end of the day, we don't want to trick people into underrepresented communities to trick uh, to trick them into working for us. We actually want to become this business, to become this company, to become the company that has a hiring process that actually makes it equitable for everyone. Right. So a company that has a fair hiring process, that has a a culture of inclusion and belonging, of uh, transparent feedback, of being able to voice out your your concerns, your feedback, good stuff, and not get repercussions. Right. Where you can be yourself, where you have the space to grow, where people are promoted with equity in mind. And so, yes, there's there's definitely uh, something to be said about how to reach out to underrepresented communities and be transparent about your current state of diversity, inclusion, belonging efforts. But I think that we really need to move away from this language of go and find a particular person, go and find me um, a black queer woman. Rather, we want to attract with diversity in mind. So underrepresented talent, we want to attract people who want to see themselves represented in what's being shared out there, right? Who are gonna audit your careers page, who are gonna audit your interviewing process, like the woman that I mentioned uh, who was actually contacting people from companies she was interested in. And that goes beyond finding talent. You need to work on strategies that are actually going to attract people when they come in contact with your employer brand and your company. And also probably um, lead by example, right? Like make the the diverse talent you already have in companies uh, more visible, um, mm-hmm. maybe through mentorship programs or or anything to actually like say um, we take these things seriously and we give everyone um, a place on our table um, rather than just being disappearing in their remote offices or so. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And also, um, I know um, asked should companies implement educational trainings for employees to create more diverse working structures? Um, I know what what exactly do you mean by that? Could you could you clarify your question? So you mean educational trainings for all the employees? I, w- I would assume maybe for um, the people who have the, the hiring um, allowance um, to actually, like as you said in the last slide, um, it's okay to have uh, biases, but also make them aware. Um, I think that requires a fair amount of self-reflection, um, maybe say some psychology training, um, um, maybe something like this, yeah. Um, I, th- I think it's definitely important um, and it is it is an ongoing learning. That's the, the thing that I, I mentioned earlier. So I, I was really blessed with my team to actually be surrounded by people who were super passionate about understanding how we can continuously keep moving the needle and understanding that this is a lifelong learning, right? That there are things that make us people of privilege to a certain extent that marginalize us from the other perspective, but there are others that sets us above a certain demographic. And we have the responsibility then to be the ones to start these conversations and to start elevating the people around us. And so this is an an ongoing educational piece that I feel like companies definitely can provide, can talk about the importance of inclusion, can talk about microaggressions, can talk about their code of conduct and what kind of Um, behaviors they will not tolerate and what kind of behaviors they will celebrate. But we need to be aware of the fact that this is the work that we need to start doing with ourselves as well, that we need to start being willing to kind of go deeper into, to challenge our own biases, to challenge our own assumptions, and then from then on to challenge our own fragility, right? To be be vulnerable about not knowing sometimes what term to use, to be vulnerable, to actually you know, ask people what their pronouns are. If we uh, make a, a, a mistake to actually say, I will do better and you know, I'll be a better ally. And this is something that I think cannot necessarily only come from an employee, employer, employer training. It really needs to be our own individual effort to try and elevate the people around us and make the world a better place. I think this was a beautiful uh, end note um, to this webinar. 
um, staying open and um, being able to, to learn and um, to engage in, in people's differences, um, I think is always helpful. And um, um, in, on that note, I, I want to thank you, Marina, for, for all the insights. I think we could talk on this topic um, for a, a much longer time because it's so important and only it, I think it will get much more important still. Um, I know here in Germany with the equality law um, being discussed um, and um, for, for Spain uh, introducing the, the gender pay um, gap kind of report or laws. And so um, it's, it's a very important topic. And um, I wanna thank you, um, uh, uh, Marina, and I wanna thank you um, all the, the participants here to, to um, well, most of you stayed um, till the end. Um, I will um, email you today or tomorrow the recorded version of this um, of this webinar in an email, um, also with Marina's LinkedIn profile. So if you have any questions, you can contact her. And um, also we are hosting another webinar uh, on the 30th of September uh, on mental health. Um, also strongly connected, I guess, to, to our topic today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it will happen, um, yes, I said Thursday the 30th, uh, also in the morning. Um, so stay tuned for this. And um, yeah, please don't uh, hesitate to contact me. If you have any questions, I can write, uh, direct you to the right people. So um, thank you so much. And um, I hope you all have a lovely day and see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Anya. Talk soon. Uh, bye. <laughs>